The moonless night hung heavily over us as we descended from the sky, our parachutes guiding us towards the heart of enemy territory. The mission was clear. Disrupt the enemy's sinister plan to unleash a devastating cyber attack upon our own nation. Our team of Green Berets, a brotherhood bound by purpose and unyielding determination, braced ourselves for the treacherous journey that awaited us. Our boots hit the ground with a muffled thud, and the tension in the air was palpable. We were deep in unknown territory, surrounded by the unknown. We had to adapt to survive and to succeed. The hostile landscape seemed to echo our defiance. A seemingly impenetrable forest that concealed secrets as ancient as time itself. As we pressed forward, our senses on high alert, a primal unease settled over us. It was during one of these tense moments that I saw it. A dark figure, large and ominous, walking upright towards me. I instinctively turned and sought refuge behind a nearby tree, my heart hammering in my chest. When I dared to glance back, the creature was disturbingly close, its presence a shadowy enigma against the night. It stood shorter than I, a looming mass of darkness with an eerie lack of visible neck. My breath caught as I realized I couldn't discern its eyes, couldn't fathom the intentions lurking within its mysterious form. It paused beside the very tree I was using for cover, a chilling realization settling over me. The creature was not only aware of our presence, but had also zeroed in on me. My heart raced as it raised its head, an uncanny movement that brought its nose to the air, sniffing as if sensing something beyond the reach of human comprehension. I was frozen in fear, my limbs refusing to obey my desperate commands to move. The moment hung in suspended terror, a breathless encounter with a being that defied all rational explanation. It was a creature of nightmares, born from the depths of the woods that harbored untold mysteries. The spell was shattered as the creature lunged, its attack swift and aggressive. The air filled with the thunderous roar of gunfire as my team reacted with the precision honed through countless hours of training. Bullets ripped through the darkness, striking the creature and forcing it to retreat into the shadows from whence it emerged. With the immediate threat subdued, we regrouped and pressed on with our mission. Yet that encounter lingered in our minds, a puzzle piece in a larger enigma we were trying to solve. As we navigated the hostile territory, infiltrated the enemy's high security facility and fought to disrupt their nefarious cyber attack plans, we couldn't shake the memory of that cryptic creature. We completed the mission, victorious in our efforts to protect our country. But even as we celebrated, the question remained, what had we encountered in the depths of that remote forest? What ancient secret had brushed against the edge of our reality that night? As we returned home, our mission accomplished, but our minds still haunted by the unknown, we understood that even in the midst of our most strategic victories, there are forces beyond our comprehension that lurk just beyond the veil of understanding. And though we would never have all the answers, we were resolute in our duty to face the darkness and protect our world from whatever mysteries it might hold. I've got a strange story to share that happened at the U.S. Army base at the Presidio in San Francisco, California. It was about the sighting of a human light creature walking on all fours with pointed ears and fangs. I remember walking back to my quarters around 2.30 a.m. when I heard some strange sounds coming from the nearby forest. As I looked over, I saw what appeared to be a naked man with glowing eyes hunched over right by the edge of the trees. But it wasn't until this humanoid creature began walking on all fours that I realized something was not right about the situation. This was no man, I realized. I watched as the creature jumped over a five-foot fence with ease before disappearing into the forest. It was about six feet tall, had pointy ears and long fangs protruding from its mouth. I thought the story would end there, but a few hours later there were two more reports of the same humanoid creature sighted around the same area. My fellow officers told a very similar story of a strange figure crossing the road right in front of their vehicles. This is where it gets interesting. That particular road was open to only Army personnel. 
So this means something from outside the base had somehow gotten in the forest. Another officer told a strikingly similar story about seeing this werewolf-like figure walking on all fours and jumping over a locked gate to get past it. We can't be sure of what exactly we saw, but there really is no other explanation than something very strange was roaming around the Presidio that night. I don't want to speculate about what this creature was, but I do admit it would be hard for somebody in the area to have an exotic pet without anybody knowing since it's so vast and remote, with many places for animals or people to hide. Whatever was out there is, unfortunately, no longer around, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. Hopefully somebody gets a good look at this thing the next time it decides to make an appearance. My second close call with a Sasquatch was up in southeast Alaska. I had spent the summer working as a deckhand on a salmon tenderer, earned a full share position for rock crab, but wanted to take a break before the salmon season ended and cod and crab began. The captain told me to stay out of the bars and go camp outside town. The plan was I'd have a couple weeks to do as I please, then meet them dockside on Kodiak. Since I was such a smart guy, I decided to ask the cannery manager if I could crash in his office instead. He said yes, so I quickly stowed my gear and then headed to the bar in town. Ended up getting drunk as hell and into an altercation with some other fishermen. I left to head back to the cannery and someone hit me in the back of the head with a blunt object. Beer bottle, maybe. I woke up at dawn, face down in the grass beside the bar, cold and drenched from a rainstorm that had passed while I was unconscious. I stumbled back to the cannery, washed the blood off my head, and checked into a motel. It took me a few days to start feeling better. The chambermaid brought me lots of soup to help with the mild hypothermia I'd gotten. While recovering, I watched a documentary about Sasquatch sightings. For some damn reason, that movie gave me the itch to go see one up close. I ended up paying the chambermaid to drive me to a gravel road that led towards a forest where Sasquatch had been spotted that time of the year. She drove me about eight miles outside of town, and I walked another seven before I bumped into a Sasquatch foraging for food next to the trail. I whipped out my digital camera and began filming it, but most of its body was obscured by ferns. The creature was about 80 yards away, and I wanted close-up footage, so I kept inching forward until it finally spotted me. It stood up on its hind legs and cocked its head. I chuckled a little at that. Then it dropped down to all fours and took a couple of steps towards me. That's when I thought, oh crap. I started backing up, and after a few steps the Sasquatch ran uphill, presumably away from me. I felt relief wash over me and started talking to the camera about how that was awesome, and I can't wait to see more. I waited five ten minutes before continuing because I wanted to give it time to clear out. I made it less than 50 feet before the Sasquatch came charging out of the bushes on a small cliff about 15 feet above me and to the left, growling and thrashing the bushes. I was caught totally off, guarded by it, and couldn't even think. My body didn't wait for a decision, though. With no thinking whatsoever, I ran as fast as I could for as long as I could. I nearly puked when I finally got myself stopped. My throat felt a little sore later that day, so I might have even been screaming while I sprinted away. And that was the end of my little excursion. Once I caught my breath and thought it over, I realized I was a total idiot for being 15 miles outside of town with no gun or bear spray. Can't believe I watched a documentary about Sasquatch sightings and felt inspired by it. I hiked about four miles back towards town when a middle-aged woman drove by and offered me a ride. This is no bullshit. She made me get into a dog cage in the back of her SUV. I didn't complain, though, because she was saving me from having to hike another 12 miles to town. Plus, I understood that I was a stranger in a remote area, and she just wanted to feel safe. Along the way, she asked what I was doing out there unarmed and told me I was a dumbass after I told her the truth. Well, that's it for my scary Sasquatch encounters. Luckily, I lived long enough to mature out of youthful recklessness. 
I hate to think what mess I would have gotten into if that Sasquatch hadn't bluff charged me and spooked me back to town. If I'd made it deeper into the forest and freaked out like that, I probably would have been in real danger. Nowadays, whenever I recount this story, I am reminded of the sheer stupidity of my younger self. But, at the same time, I can't help but feel grateful for that close encounter. It served as a wake-up call that made me reassess my actions and taught me the importance of being prepared and respecting the wild. These days, whenever I venture out into the wilderness, I make sure to be fully equipped and to educate myself about the area and its inhabitants. And, although I still have a sense of adventure, I now take a more cautious and respectful approach when exploring unknown territories. Once I was picking up hay from a farm in the middle of nowhere. It was 11 p.m. And I called the day before and asked if I could sleep on their property for my break, and they said yes. At one point, I got to dirt roads and no street signs. The GPS seemed like it was a quarter mile off. It showed my vehicle off the road I was on, and I was crossing intersections a minute or two after the GPS said I was there. When it told me to turn, there was nowhere to turn, so I drove another fifth of a mile and assumed that was where I was supposed to turn. I got a quarter mile down the road and came to a sign that said this was not a BC road and not to continue with directions on how to get there. I didn't want to back out, but going forward was a real woodsy area, so I walked down the road, some to see if I could turn around. I got to a clearing and could see about 500 feet further there were 50 or so people with robes and hoods. On and across burning. I went straight back to my truck and began to back out. Within a few minutes, someone came out in a pickup and asked what's up. I said I was lost because of GPS, and I saw the sign and decided to back out. They said they'd park and use their headlights so I could see the road when I was backing up, and I never turned back. Most paranormal. I was driving at 2 a.m. and saw someone in the road and changed lanes, slowed down, pulled over, and got out to see what was going on. I never found anyone, but I did a quick walk around of my truck, and one of my steer tires was close to failing. I was 90k pounds with flammable liquids and about to go down a curvy mountain, so I probably would have died if it blew at any decent speed. I went down the mountain at 10 miles per hour and got it repaired at the next truck stop. Just to clarify, there was no sign of a tire problem, and there was definitely someone in the roadway. I was only doing 20 miles per hour up a grade when I saw this person so having and stopping didn't do any damage. It was a decade ago, but the memory remains vivid in my mind. I was driving alone late at night, around 2 a.m., on a desolate two-lane highway in Way, upstate New York. The moonlight cast eerie shadows on the road as I cruised along, enjoying the solitude and silence that enveloped me. As I approached a long, flat, left-hand bend in the road, there was a sudden bright flash, like a camera flash, in my driver. Side window. Startled, I instinctively slowed down, my heart pounding in my chest. I scanned my surroundings, searching for the source of the light, but I was utterly alone on the road. No cars in front of me, none behind me, and none on the other side of the highway. The area was wide open, devoid of any trees or bushes that could have obscured my sight lines. I should have been able to spot headlights or taillights from any nearby vehicles, but there was nothing. Just the empty road and the haunting silence of the night. Puzzled and unnerved, I continued driving, my mind racing with questions. What could have caused that flash? Was it a trick of the light? A reflection from some distant source? or perhaps something more mysterious. As the years passed, I often found myself revisiting that night, trying to make sense of what I had experienced. I consulted friends and even researched possible explanations online, but nothing seemed to fit. Sometimes, when I find myself driving alone at night, I can't help but glance nervously at my driver's side window, half expecting to see another flash. The mystery remains unsolved. A lingering reminder that there are still things in this world that defy explanation. That night has stayed with me, a haunting memory that never fails to send a chill down my spine. 
though I may never uncover the truth behind the mysterious flash. It has left me with a profound sense of awe and wonder, a reminder of the enigmatic mysteries that lie just beyond our understanding. I've always been intrigued by the unexplained, so when I heard about a series of strange sightings on a property just outside Estacada, Oregon, I knew I had to investigate. My name is Rip Little, and I'm a journalist specializing in stories about the unknown and the mysterious. I got in touch with Stuart, a professional fish and game guide who was familiar with the area, to see if he could help me uncover the truth behind these strange occurrences. Stuart agreed to meet with me and share his story. He had been looking for a house to buy about five, six miles out of Estacada on Porter Road. While visiting a potential property, the owners had casually mentioned that an unknown creature had been seen around the area about five times. Naturally, my curiosity was piqued. As we sat down over coffee, Stuart recounted the stories he had heard from the property owners. They described a tall, bipedal creature with dark fur, walking upright like a human, but clearly not one. They said it had a distinctive, pungent odor and emitted unsettling sounds that seemed to reverberate through the forest. Stuart, being an experienced outdoorsman, was initially skeptical of the tales. He had spent countless hours in the wilderness and had never encountered anything remotely like the creature they described. However, he couldn't dismiss the sincerity in their voices, so he decided to look into the matter further. Over the following weeks, Stuart delved into local archives and spoke with longtime residents of the area. He discovered that reports of the creature went back decades, and many people in the community had their own stories to share. Some had seen it from afar, while others had experienced frighteningly close encounters. Despite the varying details, one thing remained consistent the overwhelming sense of fear and unease that accompanied each sighting. As I listened to Stuart's account, I couldn't help but feel a shiver run down my spine. There was something about these stories that struck a chord deep within me, and I knew I had to see the location for myself. Together, Stuart and I ventured out to the property on Porter Road. We explored the surrounding woods, searching for any signs of the elusive creature. Though we didn't catch a glimpse of it that day, the heavy silence and eerie atmosphere of the forest left us both feeling uneasy. The stories of the unknown creature haunted my thoughts, and I couldn't help but wonder if it was truly out there lurking in the shadows. As I continue to investigate, I can't help but be drawn deeper into the mystery. What could be behind these sightings? Is there a rational explanation, or is there something truly otherworldly at work? I may not have the answers yet, but I'm determined to keep searching until I uncover the truth. Growing up, I was always intrigued by the strange and mysterious stories my father would share from his business trips. He often stayed in run, down inns with shared rooms where he met people from all walks of life. One of his stories still sends a shiver down my spine whenever I recall it. During one of his trips, my father was staying in a ramshackle inn when a couple arrived late in the evening, asking for directions to a nearby town. The innkeeper showed them the way, but strongly advised against traveling at night, especially in the fog. Despite the couple's urgency, the innkeeper and his elderly wife insisted that they stay, warning them about the dangers of the road at night. Curious about their concerns, my father asked the couple why they were so nervous. He had walked through foggy nights before and never encountered any trouble. The couple, their faces pale and their voices hushed, shared their fears about a strange creature that had been seen in the area during the cold seasons for several years. They described the creature as a monster that lurked in the darkest forests, emerging only at night under the cover of the fog. People had spotted the creature walking along the roads, scaring the local residents. They said it resembled an ogre from ancient tales, much larger and stronger than any man. The shepherds who lived in the open fields had heard its terrifying roars in the night, but their dogs wouldn't dare bark until daybreak. When morning came, they would find the creature's massive footprints on the ground. Once, a group of villagers ventured into the forest to hunt the creature down, 
but the dense woods and darkness deterred them from staying overnight, fearing that they would never return. The creature was never seen during the warmer months, but in the cold and foggy nights, it was better to stay indoors. As my father recounted this story to me, the hair on the back of my neck would stand on end, and I couldn't help but shudder at the thought of such a terrifying creature lurking in the shadows. Even though I never saw the creature myself, I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease that settled in whenever I was out on a cold, foggy night. Years later, I still find myself glancing over my shoulder, half expecting to catch a glimpse of the ogre, like monster that haunted my father's stories. Whether it was real or simply the product of the villagers' vivid imaginations, the legend of the fog creature will forever be etched in my memory, a chilling reminder of the unknown that may lurk just beyond our sight. Twenty twenty. Five years ago, I spent a lot of time at a friend's house throughout the summer. As kids, we naturally played outside often. His house was out of town, down a private road with ten, fifteen houses on it. Over a few years' time, while playing outside, I would see a Native American, eye paint, feathers, loincloth, the whole ball of wax. We would lock eyes, then he would disappear. It happened several times, and when I would ask my twin brother or friend if they saw him, nothing, they never did. I let it go and just left it to my imagination. Fifteen years later, I now work for my father in his small business. I get a call to do an estimate for a neighbor that lived next to my friend's house. Friend had moved away and the house was under new owners. Looked over the house, pretty normal estimate. Started to partake in small talk with the elderly couple, and I explained to her we spent summertime next door as kids growing up. She asks me if I ever have seen the Indian man. My jaw dropped. Was she messing with me? Was someone playing a prank? She went on to explain that there had been a tribe that had lived along these riverbanks and that his spirit had stayed behind. I still don't know what to believe, but it was eye-opening. As an investigator of paranormal phenomena, I had always been interested in the legends and folklore of Native American tribes. So when I heard about strange occurrences happening in the Grand Teton National Park, I knew I had to investigate. On April 25th, I set out on a hike along a tributary of the park, about 2,200 feet above sea level. I was on the lookout for signs of skinwalker activity, a legend that has been passed down for generations by the Native American tribes in the area. As I made my way deeper into the woods, I noticed something strange. The tops of several fir trees had been twisted off and were hanging about eight and a half feet up. This was not something that could have been done by natural means, and it immediately caught my attention. I followed the trail further up, and to my surprise I found even more trees with twisted tops. It was as if something had gone through the woods, systematically breaking the trees as it went. I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease as I continued my hike. It was as if something was watching me, following my every move. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, and it sent shivers down my spine. As I made my way back down the trail, I couldn't help but wonder what could have caused such a bizarre phenomenon. Was it the work of a skinwalker, as I had suspected? Or was it something else entirely, something far more sinister? I couldn't be sure, but one thing was certain. I would need to investigate further. The legends and folklore of the Native American tribes had always intrigued me, and now more than ever I was determined to uncover the truth behind these strange occurrences. It was just a weekend camping trip with my buddy Mark. We were both avid fishermen, so we had set up camp near the river. Mark had caught a nice salmon earlier in the day, and we were planning on cooking it over the fire later that night. As the sun went down, we started to settle in for the night. Mark had fallen asleep pretty quickly, but I was still wide awake. 
listening to the sounds of the forest. That's when I heard something that made my heart skip a beat. It was a slow tapping sound, like rocks being knocked together. I sat up and listened, trying to figure out what it could be. It continued for a few minutes and then suddenly stopped. I shrugged it off, thinking it was just some small animal scavenging for food. But then it happened again about 15 minutes later. This time it was different though. The tapping was faster, and it came from a different direction. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was out there, watching us. I eventually fell asleep, but was awoken a few hours later by a strange noise. It was like a low growl mixed with heavy breathing. I sat up, my heart pounding in my chest, and looked out the window of the camper. That's when I saw it. Standing there in the light of the lantern was a Bigfoot. Its back was to me, and all I could see was its dark, oily, shiny fur. I couldn't believe my eyes. I had heard stories of Bigfoot sightings, but never thought I would see one for myself. I woke Mark up, but by the time he had gotten out of the camper, the creature was gone. We spent the rest of the night listening to the sounds of the forest, but didn't hear or see anything else. The next day, we packed up our camp and headed back home. I couldn't stop thinking about what I had seen. I did some research and found out that there had been other Bigfoot sightings in the area. I even read about how some people believe that it was mating season for Bigfoot during that time of year. I don't know what I saw that night, but I know that it wasn't just my imagination. It's hard to deny the existence of Bigfoot when you've seen one with your own eyes. It was a warm evening in the early 90s when my dad and his best friend headed out to a drop camp for elk hunting in Washington State. The tent had already been set up and they were a few miles away from civilization. The tent was in a uh, frame with two separate rooms divided by tent material. They never zipped up either room to keep the air flowing, and the breeze was just right. They had been surrounded by elk on the first evening of their arrival, but the next four days there was not a sight or sound of an elk. On the last night, they were lying in their cots in the back room and it was pitch black outside. My dad woke up without knowing why and heard a scraping noise coming from the front room, as if a stick was coming through the tent's side. He could see his friend sitting up on his cot and a backpack full of gear came flying through the curtain doors and rolled in between them. The backpack had roughly 30-35 pounds of gear and rolled six feet after hitting the floor. My father and his friend sat on their cots with arrows knocked and pointing at the curtain walls. They were both unarmed except for their bows. My father was scared and couldn't understand how he didn't hear anything. The forest was dead silent until the birds started chirping in the morning. My father never hunted in that area again. The incident had left him traumatized. The fact that something could come in undetected and throw a backpack without making any sound was unsettling. They had experienced something otherworldly and unexplainable. I am Ari, a young tribeswoman of the Native American tribe who have lived in the shadow of the majestic mountain for generations. Our lives have been peaceful, governed by the wisdom of our elders and the harmony we share with the land. But lately a dark cloud has fallen upon our tribe. We have been plagued by a series of unexplained and brutal animal attacks, leaving us terrified and questioning our place in this world. The elders believed that these attacks were the work of a mysterious and powerful unknown predator lurking in the dark corners of the land. And so, I was chosen to investigate this phenomenon and put an end to the terror that haunted our people. As I delved deeper into the mystery, I ventured far from our village and into the heart of the wilderness. There, I uncovered an ancient tribal legend of a shadowy creature that could control the minds of animals, turning them into deadly weapons. This horrifying revelation shook me to my core, but I knew I had to return to my tribe and share what I had discovered. However, when I finally returned to the village, my heart shattered into a thousand pieces. My tribe had been destroyed, and my family, along with everyone I had ever known, was dead. The grief was unbearable, but I couldn't let the sorrow consume me. 
I had to find the unknown predator that had caused so much pain and suffering. But as I searched far and wide, the creature remained elusive, as if it was a ghost that had vanished into thin air. I knew, though, that I couldn't give up. I had to avenge my family and my people. And I would not rest until I had found the beast and put an end to its reign of terror. As the days turned into weeks and the weeks, into months I continued my relentless pursuit. But the unknown predator remained out of reach, hidden in the shadows. One day, as I sat on a cliff overlooking the setting sun, I made a solemn vow to myself and to the spirits of my lost tribe. I would never give up. I would continue my quest for revenge, and one day I would find the creature that had brought so much darkness to our land. And so, with the memory of my family and my people burning brightly within my heart, I set off into the fading light, determined to find the unknown predator and restore balance to our world. For I am Ari, the last of my tribe, and I will not rest until justice has been served. I was deer hunting, seated on my stand at ground level, facing generally north. This field is 20 acres tractor mowed. I was near the upper middle, near a large rock and cherry tree. This entity was first seen with naked eyes. Thought it might be light and leaves playing tricks on my sight. The oak and beech brush still had their leaves. Sometimes this can happen when you are out all day in 18 Fahrenheit temps. I then observed it with 10 by 50 binoculars. It was still there. I noted that the area was very quiet, no birds or other normal outside sounds. My observation lasted about six minutes. I carry a field notebook as we are very active birders. I sketched what I saw in noted colors and size. No snow, little wind, 18 degrees Fahrenheit. The entity appeared very solid and I observed no movable joints. It never moved. The legs looked like stovepipe six inches diameter. The arms were the same, terminated in rounded ends. No digits. Ends were even with crotch. The body was also round, about 14 inches in diameter. The head looked like a round bottom bucket turned upside down, about as tall as the body was wide 14 inches. In the area where the eyes would be was a black shinny area three inches wide and stretching across the front. Overall height was over nine feet. It was standing in weeds and goldenrod. I could not see the feet. I never saw it arrive and it departed while I was scanning for deer. If it had stayed there I would have tried to approach it. I had no fear and lots of questions. I would like to know if other folks have observed similar entities and where About eight years ago, I was on a backpacking trip in the Western Sierras in Central California, above Huntington Lake, with a group of five guys from the Bow Hunters League I was running at the archery shop I worked at. We had packed in the first day about nine miles to our first camp, and had no issues. We had archery gear and had tags for deer and bears. When we woke up the next morning, we hiked to a small high country lake to refill the water and head up above tree line to glass for deer. We were about a half mile from the lake, and we heard what sounded like a limb snapping off a tree. We all joked about Bigfoot and carried on. The lake was in a big bowl surrounded by thick timber. As we were filling up our camelbacks and Nalgenes, all four of us heard the same sound we heard on our way to the lake. It was five consecutive tree knocks from five different locations around the bowl. We finished filling up our water and got the hell out of there. We stayed another night without incident and headed home when one of the guys had a sleeping bag. Break and nighttime temps in the high 30s. On our way to the trailhead the first day, we stopped in Shaver Lake and the area has had sightings in the past. Once you spend enough time out away from civilization, you see and hear things that are not simply explained. I have had a few other experiences with strange lights and apparitions on separate occasions. I believe in most of it, but I don't let it take up too much real estate in my head. Thanks for listening, cowboys and cowgirls. Hope you enjoyed these stories. Tomorrow we dive deep in the horror of American countryside. See you then. Merle?